James chapter 3. <clears throat> we're we're, we're going to end up there eventually. That way you'll already have your finger there. Verse 13, James 3, 13. When you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not there, say oh my. Amen. See? <clears throat> 313. All right, put your finger there. You can close it up now. And, and I just wanted to be legal this morning, so I officially <clears throat> pointed you to the Bible. <laughs> now it's a legal sermon. <clears throat> uh, this past uh, week, I wrote a, a blog on my, on my website uh, called Spirit, it's a series I'm doing called Spiritual Mythbusters, and it was uh, called God Hates Divorce, and it was a question mark. <clears throat> and uh, it was pretty, pretty amazing to see how uh, that one blog post turned into probably by today nearly 20,000 people went to the website to read that in a period of about three or four days. I mean, it was like boom, boom, boom. It was just spreading all over the place like wildfire. And, you know, I, I, I was thinking about it and, and, and just, you know, why is it that that particular message was so powerful? And part of the reason is, is because, you know, divorce is such a hard, painful thing to go through. I mean, it's, it, it, it doesn't matter who's right, who's wrong, whatever. But when Christians go through divorce, a lot of times there's all kinds of, you, you heap, they get heaped upon all kinds of judgment from the church. And, and, and all of a sudden, what starts to happen is that a lot of people begin to embrace messages that are coming from the enemy instead of coming from the Lord. And, and so part of what that did was sort of dispel some myths about, about divorce and what, God's perspective on it and so forth. But, but in the middle of that... It, it's, it kind of became the stepping stone for what I want to share with you this morning because, because when you're going, a person's been through a divorce or they're in the middle of a very difficult marriage situation or whatever it may be, <clears throat> there's all kinds of messages that the enemy takes his bow, the, the fiery darts of the devil, and, and begin to shoot these messages that pierce our hearts. And they, they sound like, I'm never going to be able to get married again. Nobody, if this person didn't love me, maybe nobody's going to love me. I'm not going to be able to make it. I'm a failure. I'm going to lose my this, 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 and this. And, and I'm going to lose my relationship with my children. And all these kinds of emotional things start to happen inside of us because in every one of those things, we're seeing a situation and then we, along with the enemy, are giving it meaning. We're interpreting these things separate from a relationship with Jesus. We're interpreting them as if, as if Jesus hasn't said anything about our situation. And as we've been talking about discipleship, one of the things that, that Jesus was always doing was that he was always revealing to these disciples what it meant to be in relationship with the Father. And part of that meant that Jesus did not look at situations independently from the Father. That's why he'd say, you could see, if you see me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because he would get the Father's perspective before he would respond and act and move and believe and whatever it may be. That's why um, you see Jesus saying, I only do what I uh, see my Father doing. I only say what I hear my Father saying. Why? Because he did not interpret life through the lens of his own experience because Jesus came into our darkness and into our world to reveal in, in all of us, we look at our situations, we're in this darkness and we're responding without God, but Jesus came to reveal the Father to show us this is how it works, guys. No matter what you're going through, the Father and the Son have a perspective about your situation. Because the Father still wants to give you a perspective on the thing that you're going through. He still wants to give me a perspective on the thing that we're going through. It's not just about Jesus being the Son of God and He's going around being, you know, awesome. It's about modeling our relationship that we've been brought into, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, 
Jesus was always doing this. And it goes all the way back to the garden. If you remember in the Garden of Eden, there's, there's really two things that are going on, probably more than that. But two of the things that are going on there, we've said before many times, and that is that when Satan comes to tempt Adam and Eve, the temptation is if you will eat of this tree, then you can become like God, right? What was the problem with that temptation? They were already like God. <clears throat> Religion is introduced that you've got to do something do the good, avoid the evil, and then you can become like God. The new covenant doesn't work that way. He already planted the tree of life inside of you. He already made you like God. You're already created not only in His image, but you are created in Christ Jesus. Whatever is true of Jesus right now is true of you. As He is, so are we in this world right now. But there was something else that happened in the garden. And that was that they introduced into humanity an independence in how they view the world. Because God already told them, don't eat of this tree because this is not going to be good for you. You're going to get a stomach ache really bad from this one. Don't eat the fruit of the tree. But what did they do? They, they acted and judge the situation separate from the perspective that the Father had already given them. And in every one of our lives, Jesus' discipleship is about bringing us back to this place where we're not living independently from the perspective that the Father has for each and every one of us in our lives. So, you, you look at the, the disciples, the Samaritans, for instance. Uh, Jesus goes to takes the disciples with them. They go and they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And, you know, some people are responding in all these other places. They get to Samaria and it's like the crowd is not, you know, there's no amens. There, there, there's no positive feedback. There's no uh, transformation that's taking place. And the disciples are ticked. Ticked. Can I say ticked? Ticked is okay to say as a pastor. All right. <clears throat> the disciples are ticked off. And they turn to Jesus Jesus, you want us to call fire down from heaven? Come on, we'll do it right now. We'll do it right now. Now, they weren't really asking permission. They'd already made up their minds. And actually, they believed that they were being very biblical. They believed that they were walking in the tradition of Elijah the prophet. Because Elijah called lightning down from heaven when his enemies tried to take his life. And here they are, and they're feeling that, you know, they're getting all spirit. They probably thought they were spiritual right then. In fact, they were being spiritual because Jesus responds to them and says, Guys, you don't know what spirit you are of. They were wanting to involve God in the destruction of the Samaritan people. Well, they wanted God to kill all those people because they were ticked off at them. But Jesus has to come alongside of them, the one who is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He wants to come alongside them and say, Guys, no. <laughs> That's not what the Father does. That's not what the Father looks like. That's not how this thing works. It's not about that. You don't realize that the, the interpretation that you're giving to the Scriptures and the interpretation that you're giving to this problem is not even me. Same thing happens when they're in the back of the boat and the water is splashing up over the side and, they're, and, and they're, you know, it's a bad storm. They got their buckets and they're trying to get the water out and it's getting worse and worse and they don't know what they're going to do. And they look and Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat. Jesus. Come on now. Now, by the way, I, I, I told this to somebody. I'm not sure y'all believe me. Uh, I didn't look it up yet, but... Uh, I heard a reference not too long ago that, um, that I think is 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes, of preaching is equivalent to uh, physically, is equivalent to eight hours of, of work. Do you know that? I'm serious. <laughs> They're like, yeah, you're just trying to get out of work. No, I'm serious. <laughs> Jesus has been ministering all day long. He's coming out of a place of, of ministry and lay hands on the sick and people being healed and all these things are happening and he, then he's riding in the back of the boat not because he's at peace I know that's a great sermon it's probably because he's exhausted 
He's sleeping in the middle of the storm. And, and the disciples wake him up and say, Jesus, what do they say? Don't you care that we're going to die here? Now look, probably what they were doing was they had taken one of those buckets and given Jesus, don't you care that we're dying and hands him a bucket? Why? Because they were shocked when he stood up and said, peace be still, and the wind and the waves calm. They weren't expecting that. They just wanted another hand to help them bail the water out. And Jesus responded to, to them is, guys, where's your faith? Not that they didn't have enough like it was a meter that they were a thermometer they were trying to, to get to the top of. He said, where was your perspective on this situation? Don't you know that I've got to, I've got to go to the cross, that my Father's with me, that we've got a mission to accomplish, we're going to make it to the other. Don't you have my perspective on this situation? Now, we do this all the time. And we do, we do it all the time. Your daughter, Michaela, excluded. I think, she, is she gone? There you are. Uh, we made a deal years ago with our kids. that they they like, don't use me in an illustration. And, and I'd forget. And, uh, and so there was, I had to pay a dollar every time that I use them. So there's a backlog over here <laughs> of money that I owe Michaela. <laughs> She's keeping a tally. So your daughter or your son is supposed to be home at 10 o'clock. But it's 11.45. And at 11.45, you have already begun this process. And inside, it's not that they're late. Inside, you've gone from maybe they had a flat tire. Maybe on the way home, they pulled off on the side of the road. Maybe they forgot to call. Maybe they had a car wreck. Maybe they're in a ditch and they can't call. Maybe they're dead. <laughs> now what started as just the fact that they were late all ends up becoming that your child is dead in the ditch somewhere. <laughs> and then they come home five minutes later and you're like, oh my God, I'm so glad you're okay, honey. Are you okay? You okay? You good? Yeah, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> What we, what we do is we, is we take that moment of time when we don't understand what's happening and we give meaning to it separate from the relationship that we have with our Father. We do it, we do it in, uh, when, people get a, a, when we get offended at people or people get offended at us. Somebody gets offended uh, or we get offended with somebody and usually it's because we, they say something or they do something and we eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We think that we know exactly why they said that. We, I can't believe, did you hear what she said? And an outsider is looking, yeah, I heard what they said. What are you talking about? And, and because in here, all of a sudden it took on meaning. And that meaning is, they think I'm stupid. They think I'm this. They, who do they think? They, nobody's going to talk to me that way. And you start, you know, start getting the finger thing going. I can't do it. You know, Michaela can do that. Yeah, see, I can't do the head thing, you know. I look really weird when I do it. <laughs> Michaela tried to teach me to. Is that what it is? Is it a, I'm going to keep moving. All right, so. <laughs> so. So when we, when we interpret that situation apart from Jesus, apart from the Father speaking to us and interpreting those things or through uh, in separate from relationship, you know, it would be so much easier if we asked them, you know, that, that bothered me. What did you mean by that? Why is that so hard? Why is it so hard to have relationship? In Christ, the Father wants us to, we think, you know, I'm just going to pray about it. I'm going to pray to the Lord about it. And the Lord is going to take this away because I'm very spiritual. I'm not going to let that get under my skin. I'm very spiritual. And we, what, what that means is I'm really mad and I'm going to ask God to get them. Or how do I get out of this relationship easier now? that I'm hurt and offended, and all of a sudden I start hearing the Lord about how I don't have to be friends with this person anymore. That ain't the Lord. That was the 
immaturity for us to be able to step across the aisle and say, that hurt me somehow. Can, you, can we talk about this? And then all of a sudden in that, in that scenario, you know, the, you know, the Bible says love covers a multitude of sin. If, if, and so there's things that people do in our lives that, you know, you just like water off a duck's back. It's like, yep, oh well, <laughs> love them anyway. <clears throat> and, but then there are things that hurt. But in that moment of hurt, if love ain't covering a multitude of sin, the Father's perspective is not simply going to be Him speaking down from heaven. It's going to come as you reach out to that person and hold them by the hand and have a relationship with that other person. See, everything that we do separate from relationship with God, a relationship uh, with um, that other person is always going to infuse meaning, interpretation, uh, a perspective into the situation that's going to continue to wound our own hearts. <clears throat> you notice that the disciples, they like did not even think to even ask the question. It is like rarely was the case where the, where the disciples said, Jesus, what do you think about this? No, they did it, and then Jesus would have to say, what, what? It's like herding cats. Can you imagine with these disciples? It's like they're all over the place. No, 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 don't do that. <clears throat> Jesus, these guys never even considered the fact that they might be wrong. Wow, what an idea. I might be wrong. Nah. <laughs> In fact, I don't think when it comes to the way that we view the world and the things that are going on and the things that are happening to us, we are often just like those disciples and we don't even consider the fact that the interpretation we're giving to this event <clears throat> might be wrong. In fact, it amazes me sometimes in my own life, but in other people too, because it's more fun to talk about you, and that is <clears throat> that it amazes me sometimes that we don't realize how much authority we have over our own thoughts. I mean, some people, they've never even considered the fact that these thoughts that come into their head might not even be true. That we, because we've lived with them for so long, we think that it's the truth about the situation, or it's the truth about our lives, or it's the truth about a message about what happened, or whatever it may be. And we never even consider that, that Jesus might actually have a completely different perspective. Uh, uh, we don't do a, <clears throat> a lot of inner healing type of counseling, but sometimes the Lord will take you, <clears throat> excuse me, I've seen so many times when people would, would have a memory of something they just keep, you know, keeps bothering, keeps bothering, them, and they never, and then eventually they ask the question, Jesus, where were you? And he shows them. And all of a sudden, the perspective is completely changed. All of a sudden, they didn't know that, in fact, I had a dream when I was a little boy, probably had to have been five, six years old. I had a dream. We were living in our house on Barwood, and, uh, and I had this dream where I hear in the dream my parents are outside fighting, and, um, and I get up out of the bed in the dream, and they usually were, and uh, I get up out of the bed, and I go to the window and I try to open the shades. And when I, when I do, it, I, I, I get um, pulled up into them, or like rolled up into the shades, like I'm trapped. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, uh, one day I asked, I just sort of, I like, I, I didn't never, I couldn't figure out what this meant or what it meant. And I said, Jesus, where were you in, in that? I was trying to interpret that. And he just showed me how he was standing right with me it, as a little child and it is, I didn't see it. <clears throat> There's so many things in our lives that we don't realize he's with you. You weren't alone. His presence was there. His power was there. His grace was there for every one of us. And if the way that we're interpreting a situation, if we're looking at something that happened, and I don't care if it's ISIS or if it's your flat tire, the way that we look at that 
If it's not producing peace or joy, it's probably not God's interpretation. You say, but, but yeah, but they're cutting people's heads off. It's terrible. Yeah, but have you got God's perspective on that? Can you, can you see that, that even in darkness and evil, that God's power can bring redemption and hope? Can you look back at the scriptures and see that in, the, in you know, some of the, the most dark Bible, uh, I mean, uh, book of the Bible in the Old Testament is probably like the book of Lamentations. I mean, how many of you did your devotionals this morning out of Lamentations? <clears throat> Lamentations is like, e I mean, it's like, woe is me. It's bad, and, and rightfully so in what they're going through. But, you know, even in Lamentations, there's this declaration that, that his mercy, uh, great is his faithfulness. His mercies are new every morning, and great is his faithfulness. All the prophets, when they would, even in the Old Testament, when they were prophesying that there was these things that were coming on the city or, or on Jerusalem or whatever, as they would prophesy those, there was always going to be this declaration of hope of something that was coming past that. If God tells you, that you're going to die in three days. If it's God, He's also going to tell you that in the three days point one, that you're going to be ushered into the glory of, of His kingdom and you're going to see angels and God's going to be there for you. And, and it's never outside of the goodness of God. No matter what it is. So our interpretations that don't, we're, we're now at James chapter 3. Look, the cycle that we go through, and, and this is, I wish that God would like wave a magic wand over us. Man, wouldn't that be cool? Like, shoom, and, and all of our negative thoughts and interpretations would just instantly just go like that. When God saved you, He may give you a new heart. He gave you a new spirit. He made you a brand new creation. But the Bible says we have to renew our minds. Your mind did not get saved. You have the mind of Christ, but we have to choose what thoughts we're going to allow in our heart and what thoughts we're going to embrace as, as if they're from us when they're really from darkness. In fact, one of the scriptures in Ephesians um, says to renew your mind uh, in the spirit of your mind. The better translation is to renew your mind according to who you are in your spirit. And nobody's going to do that for you or me. And cycles can be broken of drama and depression and da-da-da-da-da-da-da, you know, whatever it is. Cycles can be broken when we start to learn, I have the power to not let my heart go down that road anymore. I don't have to go there. I can actually get God's perspective on the situation. James chapter 3, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy, by the way, never get... You know, the Bible says that a root of bitterness will spring up and defile many. Never get wisdom from a bitter person. <laughs> Just a word of wisdom... If somebody's bitter, they, their bitterness will defile you. They will, it smears your heart with a different perspective. And if they, if they had the right perspective, then they wouldn't be bitter right now. I'm not stepping on any toes on purpose, but it just got real quiet in here. <clears throat> if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. This, there's nothing wrong with your senses, but when you operate in our senses, what you feel is going on separate from what God says, then you'll always end up with a demonic interpretation of the situation. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom which is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield. Wow. Full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. In other words, 
if what you're feeling, sensing, going through emotionally, you're feeling all this stuff, it probably means you've got a, an interpretation of that situation that did not come from above. If it's not producing peace uh, inside you, I know you can't control other people as much as within you be at peace with all men. You can't as much as within you be at peace with all men. So it's about what's in us. And if the interpretation we're getting, the wisdom that we're getting is not producing some sense of peace in us, then it might not be from the Lord. It may be some interpretation that we just, some tape that we keep running around in our head, some interpretation that we keep seeing. Because once we start to see something a certain way and put those glasses on, then we start to see that same thing everywhere. You'll start getting it reinforced I'm not any good is an, is an interpretation of a situation or I'm going to be a failure, then guess what? Those glasses are going to find ways to see you as a failure everywhere you go. You're going to see yourself as no good everywhere you go because that's the lens and somebody has to take that lens off and it's not going to be your pastor or your best friend. You are the only one who can steward your own heart. I'm the only one. You can't do it for me. You can encourage me. You can give me the truth. My heart can start to bear witness with it. But then I've got a choice to make of what I'm going to do with these glasses. Every one of us have those choice of what we're going to hear. And if it's not producing a sense of peace, because listen, the entire fabric of the universe is made out of love. Think about that. Everything that was created was created by God. God is Therefore, everything in the, the very nature fabric of everything that exists, exists because of love, is made out of His love. If it's not functioning right, if ISIS is doing this, or the government's doing this, or whatever's doing this, they, that all may be true, but it's the reason is because they're not functioning in seeing the world through the lens of love. If they could see what Jesus see, if they could see it the way He sees it, if they could see it from His perspective, then everybody would just live happily ever after. If it doesn't sound like love, it's probably not a good interpretation and there's probably nowhere that that strikes us the most than our own identity. Because the enemy, as you, as you heard me say, and we've said many times before, you know, when, when Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, it's if you are the Son of God. And every, every time that, that we're feeling those heart wounds in our lives, it is most likely because we are listening to the accuser of the brethren and we're giving him more of a voice and an authority and a credibility than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Because if you're in Christ, you are accepted in the beloved. If you're in Christ, you are loved by the same way that the Father loves the Son is the exact same way that God loves you. Without exceptions... He sees that you're seated with Him in heavenly places. That is the truth. You say, but you know, God, if He really, if, he's, if that's the truth, if I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places, why is He letting all my yucky stuff be on the throne? You know, God's not blind. He can see our stuff. But He's not relating to you through your stuff. He's relating to you through the fact that you're in Christ. And if you could see what He sees and see that you were made out of the fabric of love, then all of a sudden all the views of yourself that have been built on everybody else's opinion and you start getting the counsel of the Father in here, you're not a bad person. You're not. Jesus would have to deny himself in order to call you a bad person. Why? Because his spirit and your spirit became one. And for him to say you're a bad person is to say that he's a bad person. No, you are good because he's good. You're amazing because he's amazing. You're loved 
He's loving you. That's the only message. So what happens if you're going through a difficult situation or something's happening and you're saying, okay, God, I'm waiting for you to like tell me something here. I really love your perspective on this. Why did this and why did this and why did this? Is probably not the kind of thing he's going to tell you. But he is going to give you a perspective on this and this and this. You say, but I'm not hearing anything. If you're not hearing anything, then wait until you do. What's that? And listen. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I mean, how we don't realize that we have the authority to not interpret this situation. We have the power to go, you know what? I'm just going to withhold judgment until the Lord tells me how I ought to feel about this. I'm not going to let my heart give this meaning and this meaning and this. Man, you, you, uh, there's things that happen to us in, in Trish and I's life. There's things that, that, that we sometimes can't share with people in the congregation. There, there are, there's stuff that happens in our, there's stuff that happens in your lives. And, and it, sometimes it's like sledgehammers, like Thor and all of his buddies decide to throw hammers at us all at the same time. And we, get, we have to make a choice, you have to make a choice of whether you're going to give meaning to that. Oh my God, my life is going to die. Oh God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a failure. Oh God, this is going to go, this is going to crash. Oh God, and we start separately interpreting life different than God interprets it. And it's hard, but sometimes you've got to give your heart. I'm telling you, there is peace when you're not constantly having to live from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know, we make, we make discipleship really hard because we think we have to figure God out before we follow him. With a formula, Right? You know, here's how you follow Jesus. Listen to him and do what he says. It's really not that hard. <laughs> Listen and believe what he says. That, that, that's simple. Not I got to figure God out and then I'll start. No, we start learning to, okay, here's the situation, Jesus. What do you want me to do? Well, I want you to love him. I don't have to figure out all the different, all the uh, what meaning, and they don't like me, and now they're going to, and stop it. <laughs> stop it. That's what I tell my heart. Stop it. And I do. And then the only thing I'm required, or the only thing that, I, that I'm drawn into is a call to love that person or care for that person or speak a good word into their lives because, as Dan Muller says, if they knew who they were, they wouldn't do what they do. And what we want to invest in that situation is justice. But what's needed in that situation is mercy. Because if they're feeling that so, and I'm saying if it's a person, maybe a situation, but, but if it's a person, if they're feeling, they're coming across as being hard and judgmental and, and hurtful and da, da da all this stuff, then there's a, something about Jesus that they can't see. Well, where do you think they're going to ever see it? Is it going to be like, you know, a bird floats out of heaven and comes down and whispers and, you know, and floats back out? No. It's the incarnation of Christ in me that has to be the revelation of the goodness of God to them so that they can see God in a way they've never seen before. Because if they're being judgmental, they believe that He's judgmental. And the only way to break that off is to give them something other than what they believe that God is. And in that place, <laughs> you start to see amazing things happen. Real quick, I know I'm running out of time. I'm like way running out of time. Um, Michaela, Michaela and I, uh, I'm sure nobody saw on Facebook or the news or anything about the color of the dress thing. <laughs> now look, I, I, all I saw was people talking about it on Facebook, and I'm thinking, what, what is the deal? So Michaela comes home from school, 
And she's, she's talking about how at school, everybody, all the, I mean, it's just like for the whole school. So, and if you don't know what it's about, apparently there's this picture of a dress. And some people say that <laughs> we are not going to have a church fight over the dress. <laughs> so me, Michaela, I said, well, I want to see it. And so we're looking at it. And I say, well, obviously it's white and gold. What's the problem? And, and Michaela looks at me and she's like, no, Dad, it's black and light blue. I'm like, N no, it's not. So, so we're sitting here like, uh, what, what do you mean? And, 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 and so, I look, I get out the, the laptop, and I put in uh, colorblindness tests. So, because one of us has got problems. <laughs> and we're both doing the colorblind test, and both of us, are normal, relatively speaking. <laughs> and yet we're both seeing the exact same thing in two different colors. If it's that easy for us to have that kind of dramatic, if you, if you see that it really is white and gold, but it's a <laughs> dramatic difference, I could be wrong. If it's, if it's that easy for something as simple as that, how much more do we find ourselves interpreting life through a lens that's not true? If you're feeling something other than peace and joy, then there's somewhere that you've embraced an interpretation of yourself or of something that's happened to you separate from your father. Because your father loves you. I'm finished. This is my third conclusion. <clears throat> In uh, John, 1 John chapter 2, it talks about how we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus. Now, most of us have read that through a legal perspective. That, that he is, the, the, the Holy Spirit or Jesus is our advocate that's used in both of those cases. And um, he's sort of our legal like sidekick to come and when we're standing before the father jesus say no don't kill him father i i, I shed his blood i shed my blood for him and don't be mad at him father and father's like you know I, I, all right only because you said so jesus that that's the legal picture courtroom scene but that's not what it is the holy spirit comes to us in the the word uh, paraclete one who is one who consoles or comforts or encourages or uplifts. So what is the Holy Spirit doing in every situation? He's trying to give you an encouraging perspective, an uplifting perspective. He's trying to give you a, a, uh, an encouragement. As he's come, the word means to come alongside and tell you, you know what, it's going to be okay, Chuck. He may tell you the truth. You know what they did? That was really wrong, but... He's the one who's going to comfort your heart in that so that you're not pulled into the mire of darkness and separated from peace and joy in your life. That's how discipleship works. It works by letting the Father give His perspective on life. Let's pray. Father, I thank You. Thank You for this time together. Lord, I, want, I, I don't want to just be the, somebody who's saying this. I want, to, I want to live this, God. I thank you that you are the comforter. You are the advocate. You're the one who comes to remind me of who I am in you. And I bless you, God. Thank you. I know, Lord, that there's a time to weep, but you said... Joy comes in the morning. And God, every one of us in this room have perspectives about situations that we're going through right now that are probably not very accurate. God, I'm asking, help us to learn to pause, listen, even if it's children in the other room. Listen, like children to our daddy.
And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. A couple of quick things as we close. We have, uh, we have like 10 minutes, 15 minutes uh, business meeting thing that we need to do. And then we have at our home, our discovery is today. Now discovery is a, is a time at our home where we ask newcomers to come and we tell them about how we started the church, kind of where it's headed and those kind of things, kind of an introduction to his house and kind of our story about how the Lord put that together. So if you would, uh, we'd love for you to be a part of that if you're a newcomer. If you haven't been through Discovery, that's going to be at our house at about 10 minutes after we leave here. So if you need to get up, we're going to take two minutes if you got to go to the bathroom or something. If, you, if you're not a part of the business meeting, then that's cool. Um, enjoy your lunch. And uh, the only thing we're going to do in our business meeting is just talk about asking... Um, what are we doing? We're, if you've got any questions about the finances, we tried to send that out to everybody. If you're on the email list, you would have gotten that already. So if you've got questions about that, and um, that's pretty much what we're, we're going to talk about one other things, but that's, that's it. So two-minute break, and then we meet back here in two minutes. <laughs>